Hey everybody, this is Mihai with Pro Media Training, and I'm here today at the Hideout Recording Studio with Kevin and Kane Cherko. How are you guys doing today? Good. Excellent. Thank you. Another Monday. So we're here in your amazing studio. Um, by the way, it's beautiful and it's got a great vibe. Thanks. Um, and you guys have been doing a lot of records out of here for a while now. So can you just uh, tell everybody like what some of the projects are that you guys have worked on? Uh, sure. We've, we've done... Uh at the Hideout, we've done everything from Disturbed to Five Finger Death Punch um, to Papa Roach. The, the studio itself is just a regular recording studio, so anybody can come here. So CeeLo Green's been here. I mean, just had Chris Angel in here uh, yesterday. So there's a really variety of clients that come to the studio itself. But as far as our our production clients, they would you know range from uh, mostly in the rock world but uh, from Ozzy. Ozzy didn't record it, I recorded that at his house, but uh, you know, those would be some of my production clients. And uh, yeah. Now when you say production clients, just to clarify, you are a, a songwriter, a producer, engineer, you do everything, and a musician. You're not just mixing, you're not just recording, right? Right. Yeah. So you guys do that for for pretty much every project? No, no, I don't think so. I think I think it, it can change. I mean, the the personally, the jobs I gravitate towards are those kind of jobs where I can be really immersed in the whole thing. I like those kind of jobs where I'm part of everything. When I look back at my career, it seems like those jobs have done better than some of the other ones where I'm just engineering or just uh, producing or something. So I just choose those jobs because I'm interested in all those things. But generally the way that it works is someone hires one of us as producer and then we just kind of fill in the, the holes, fill in the, the, you know, fill in the weak parts. So if someone brings me in 12 great songs that don't have to be altered, changed, modified, improved, great. Uh, that just doesn't happen a lot because generally people also think of me as a writer so they're, they're not even finishing stuff ahead of time, they're just bringing in ideas, I got all these ideas, what can we do with this? And then we just start getting to work and say, well, we can do this and that and this and that and take it from there. And then just because of, uh, I end up working with the same people over and over again just because I can't say no. And they can't, you know, I'm pretty per persuasive myself. So, uh, you know, it just kind of turns out that after the first record, everybody knows the drill and they come back and, and then sometimes they bring even less ideas the next album, <laughs> less after that. But I like that process because, you know, because we're working in the same room, you can get some good chemistry with certain people. I would do things I wouldn't normally do because they're, you know, they're giving me ideas. They would probably move outside their box and I'd give them different ideas. And it just becomes a lot more focused on them because rather than me being a songwriter and writing songs for somebody, I'm writing songs with them, for them. And so, because everybody has their own perspective, their own agendas, their own ideas of what you know they want to represent and trust me they're all different even if my genre seems a little narrow every one of my artists is very different on what they want to say and how they want to say it so it's more personalized approach of of that rather than you know it's not just a good song is a good song in pop maybe a good song is a good song but in rock it you know it really has to suit the perspective and the direct not the musical direction of the band but the philosophical direction of the band too so obviously if i'm writing with a female very different lyrics than if I'm writing with a male. So if they come in here and don't have a whole bunch of songs, no problem. If they have all the songs, no problem. Then if they need, you know, some work on the arrangements, we can do that. If you know, you just kind of look at the weakest link. I just kind of look at everything as, what's the weakest link? What's the weakest thing about the song or this project? And then you fix that. And then obviously there's another weakest link, and then you fix that, and then you go up that chain until finally, there's nothing you feel you have to change or you've run out of time or um, you've run out of the ideas that, that you need and then you're done. Mm -hmm. Wow, so let me ask you guys, like Kane, um, how do you approach, and then Kevin, please answer as well, how do you guys approach what projects you will undertake, like what you're gonna take in as a personal project like that? I think it's similar for both of us, but maybe, maybe a little different. Um, in general, I think um, the clients kind of seek us out first. Um, usually from past records we've done. Um, it's, it's rarely that I'm contacted by the industry. More, usually I'm contacted by the bands directly first. You know, a singer just heard a record and he, I like this record and I want to make a record like that. And 
we start a conversation. It usually starts at a conver conversation. Which is, I don't want to interrupt, but which is actually amazing these days because you can connect to those people through social media. It's easy to find everybody these yeah. days, whereas maybe 20 years ago, if I was a fan of Mutt Lang, I couldn't just connect with Mutt Lang and say, can you produce my band? You know, but now they can. They can contact him, him direct. Yep. Yeah, no, and it's, so it's, it starts there. Starts, we yeah, try to jump on the phone, try to talk to them, see if just our philosophies and personalities align, because that's very important. I mean, when you're spending three or four months in, in a studio in a small space with, with some people, it's, it, it's, it's a lot better when you like the people. <laughs> and records for us aren't three weeks of coming in here to record and leaving. I mean, it's a process. Like I said, we're stripping everything down, building it back, back up. Especially when you're doing writing with, with those people because it's a very, that's a very personal thing and it's their, it's their baby, really, ultimately. And you're kind of the, the nanny for a minute, sort, yeah. of, sort of helping them take care of it until you, know, until you, don't, need to, <laughs> until you don't need to anymore. And um, uh, That's what I am, <laughs> nanny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It seems like a lot of great things start with a conversation, and, yeah. and, it, and it builds from there. And, and uh, I'm assuming that Kevin, you kind of the same thing. You hang out and yeah. have a conversation yeah. with people and get to know if the philosophies line up, right? I mean, honestly, these days, I think I think we can assess the artist very quickly, mm -hmm. based on this is what I do every day of my life. And so, even before the artist gets here, you know, you again, you can find everybody online. You watch interviews with them, you get a sense of who they are, you look at the past catalog if they have one, and you go, okay, this is what the band has done. And then generally I'll get on the phone with them and say, okay, I kind of know what you've done. What do you want to do? How can I help? Because ultimately we work for the artist. You know, I don't look at it, you know, any other way than I'm an employee mm -hmm. of the artist. And um, so I look at it also as how can I bring value to that person? And if it's somebody who's pretty self-contained, meaning that um, they can kind of produce their own records, I'm not interested. Because, well, you can already do it. Why do you want to come to us and why do you want to come to me then? You know, I want to give you value. I want to, you know, I can't charge you the big bucks unless I help you make the big bucks. And so a th couple things have to happen. First of all, um, they have to be willing to give you some kind of license, you know, which generally means they like your past stuff. Or some cases they don't, but their A and R guy put them on to you, so all of a sudden now they have to have that phone phone conversation with you, and I don't like that. Anytime any A and R guy or manager phones me and says, "I want my artists to work with you," I said, "Do they want to work with me?" Because sometimes uh -huh. they don't. I mean, just like I would look at like at, at an artist and say, "You've done five records; it's all been the same thing. You're this thing." They look at me and go, "Your biggest records are A, B, and C, and they all are kind of this thing. That's who you are, and that's not necessarily who I am, because if I have a female." Uh, alt pop gal coming to you know to, to ask me if I want to work with her. I don't I don't just dig up my five finger death punch sounds and say okay here you go now you're the alt pop singer with the, yeah. you know it's not like that at all it's really custom but I like doing other things it's just that as it works out generally where you're successful those kind of same people keep on calling you or those kind of bands hear the other guy's record and they want that or they see the success and they want to tag tag team on that so it, so it becomes that but for me it's extremely important these days because now I have choices. In my early days, maybe I didn't have as many choices as I have now. But now I have choices of who I work with and I want to work with people I generally like or I want to work with people I think that are really committed to being successful. That doesn't mean being, um, committed to being successful doesn't mean selling every you know ounce of your soul. Mm -hmm. It just means I do a certain thing. I like it to reach as many people as I can and you can help me, meaning me. And I say, yeah, I think I can help expand that, that you know, your, your fans. I can, you know, help you maybe do some things you wouldn't normally do. I can make sure it's ch channeled for a radio play because no matter what we all think, you know, there's the art of making a record, but then there's a the business of it too. And if you don't take care of the business, you can't even make the art unless you just have some rich brother. Vincent Van Gogh could have his brother could finance him. I mean, not many people are that, that lucky. So if you go to a record company, the record company wants to make money back. It's simple. And so my, I find my biggest job and my biggest advantage, and this is starting to sound, sound like hire me, it's not that at all, <laughs> but I, th I think where I get it, I think, is that I really work for the artist, but part of that process is to liaison to the company, too, and make sure that everybody has what they need. Mm -hmm. So if the record company is expecting th three singles, well, 
the client, the artist has to know, okay, we definitely got to get three singles out of this because that's what they want. And if we get three singles and you like those, great. If you know you don't like them, well, you might have to compromise a little bit because they need that to sell your other nine, 12 minute long epic masterpieces <laughs> that are going to get played on radio and give you the advertisement. You know, radio, singles, videos, they're an advertisement of who the artist is. Mm. And that's the most important thing. And that, you know, those other songs will create fans. But the singles are kind of like the jingles for the for the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So it's really interfacing everybody and making sure the goals are clearly defined. And you know, if you don't want to do radio songs, don't tell me you want radio songs because we can have fun all day and just yeah. create interesting music. But don't let's not do that and then at the end of it say, "Where's your singles?" Because you told me you didn't want that. Mm -hmm. Now let me ask you. So <clears throat> a lot of people in the questionnaire have kind of asked in how when you do decide to work with an artist, how do you approach the beginning? How do you start a new production? Like, is there a certain philosophy? Is there a certain, like, okay, we always start with drums and bass first and we figure out those parts? Or is there, is there a technique or a style that you guys gravitate towards with starting a production and, and knowing where to begin with an artist? I'll let you take this one, but just the first thing I'll say is the first thing I do on any new project is we just go for lunch mm -hmm. and we just clearly get to define what we're doing and just talk about it rather than get into it and me passing a guy a guitar and say, okay, go. Wow. You got to have, you got to, you got to be able to talk about it because musical, music is an emotional thing. And it's just not somebody brings me a demo, I play the demo and we re recreate that. It's, it's, again, it's that whole thought process that maybe we had on the phone earlier on, but now we're having in person, like, has anything changed? What are you listening to? What do you like? So it's a continuing conversation yeah. from, from the beginning and it just evolves and evolves as you get to know one another. Absolutely, and I, I think at that point the conversation when you start, when you start the project becomes what's our goal? What, what's the team's goal? You know, because you need to establish where you're going, kind of. I mean, you can arrive different places and still end up somewhere cool even if you didn't plan to get there. That happens all the time. But, um, you know, I, th I think as workers we, we like to, to think about where we're going to end up and then try to get there whether it's we know we need three singles okay that's part of our goal we know we want to do three epic 12 minute masterpieces that's on the album too that's part of part of our goal um, maybe it can be what we want to talk about you know often our clients can be going through different personal things different things in their in, in their lives you know what do they want to say what do they want the theme of the the, the tone of the content of the record to be let's say yeah um, and really trying to satisfy those, maybe maybe talking about past songs they've done that they've loved. How do we, you know, capture some of the some of the elements of that? It can be something as simple as we've done a slow song once and we want to do more slow songs, or it can be something as um, specific as we did one song before we started right with the vocal and that was so cool. Let me I write out a note. Let's write one song where we start with the vocal, <laughs> you know, and really try to capture just all the wants and 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 things that we uh, that that we think we want to produce and um, brainstorm them, flesh, fle flesh them out. From that point, it becomes just how do, how do we get there? <laughs> yeah, in the studio, then, it doesn't have to become too much of a, we need to talk about this. It's more like we need, just need to do it. We've already talked about it. We already know it. Here's what the, what the it, guideline is. It, it gives you an anchor point to revert back to, too, because then you can say, well, when, on day one, you said you wanted this, this, and this. You know, and maybe at that point, they're asking for something different. And now they want 12 12-minute 12 masterpieces instead you know, and of it's nine. Like, again, 12. it's fine to change the direction, but sometimes they'll be like, oh yeah, you're right, thank you for keeping me in check. You're right, this wouldn't fit with the tone of the rest of the record, even though it's cool. And you know, it's, it's, it's easy as an artist to go in tangents. I think it's our job to try to save people from those tangents. <laughs> a, a lot of times it's saving them from themselves, or rather ke keeping them focused on what truly will help their career and themselves. But it will, I had one, one record that we were both involved on, literally, we finished six songs, and in the middle of it, the A&R guy calls us and goes, uh, yeah, music's changing now, so we, I, we love what you did, and that's exactly what we asked you for, but now you got to do this. And it was, you know, similar. They're just rock bands, so it's not like it's going to be that different, but we had to then morph it into a whole other thing. So it's like you have to be flexible, but at the same time, I like to know, you know, and I like to make sure everybody's on the same page. I can't have the artist working against the label and the label working against them. And even if it's to the point of the label knows the artist doesn't want to do those things, but as long as everybody agrees they have to be done, it's not that, it's not that hard of an experience, it's not that bad of an experience. It can still be fun. 
you know I mean a lot of times um, some sometimes it's difficult or when it is difficult to get an artist to try new things I think the advantage that we have too like going our own place is that I don't have to go on the hook necessarily for studio time I mean, yeah, I got to pay the bills and all that, but it's not like we have to phone energy and book four more days of studio time, and someone's got to, you know, fork fork over that cash. So, it's more along the lines. I think the best thing to do for anybody is just try things. Just because you try it doesn't mean it's going to live, and doesn't mean it's good. You know, I might get you to do some things that you don't like, you don't want to try, but try them. You might like them, and then maybe you like them even more than you thought. Or if all we do is find out, yeah, you really don't want to do that then we've checked that box and we won't try it again. Yeah, that's one know? of the, the kind of m mantras that I start a project off with with the band and I tell them up front, I say, I love trying stuff and to me it's usually quicker to try something than it is to talk about whether or not we should try it. <laughs> um, and to, to me that, that way works the best when you just try, when, you know, if you're talking about well, should we do this and you got four band guys being no because this and this and th they're all, you know, you spend 10 minutes talk talking about not doing something versus two minutes just tracking that part and saying, oh, actually, that's really cool. Or maybe that's not as cool as we thought. And it could be cool, though, if we just change this back, this, this piece of it or whatever. And you go, di you go a different, different way. And to me, that helps keep momentum. And keeping momentum is a big part of staying on track and getting, and getting a record done. Um, and, and I think keeping the artist from crawling too deep inside their head. When they got too much time and when you're stalled too long, it psychs everybody out. You know. It seems like uh, you guys really uh, subscribe to the uh, just turn knobs, you're never going to break anything philosophy. Uh, I remember getting that lecture as, as an intern early in my career yeah. when I had questions about stuff. And at the time, I was told, just turn knobs and do it. What's the worst that could happen? You can always go back to zero and say, I don't, I don't like it or I do like it. And it uh, seems like you guys really subscribe to that philosophy quite a bit. It's just yeah. music. We're not paramedics. We're not trying a new heart surgery. We're just trying a new guitar part. Trying a new guitar, trying a new verse, trying, you know. The other thing is, is I like to try more than one verses and more than one courses because, you know, try to beat it. Like, I always try to beat whatever they have, whatever I have. Let's try to beat it because we can always come back to this. We can always retreat to it. Mm -hmm. But some people get ca so caught up in their ideas out of ego or out of vanity that they just don't even want to go that extra step. But, so again, they're sabotaging themselves because they don't want to try. And so those kind of clients don't do well, well with me. And for myself, too, is that a lot of times I'll have a definite idea of how songs should go, but I will always let the artist, you know, or guitar player, singer, do whatever they want to do, and, and I'll be as honest as I can. Yeah, you know what? That's way better. That's way better than what I brought in. Cool. In fact, I prefer the artist to do it because then they have more ownership of it. They have license for it. They firmly believe in it. I, it's hard for somebody to give... Um, artist lead singer a lyric and say now sing this you know they really have to have some almost some skin in the game they really it really has to be meaningful to them at least the good artist you can give anybody a song they'll they'll sing it or any if it's song connects if an artist connects with a song they'll do a great job but i think when you're creating new music um you know it's good for everybody to bring the ideas in and and then listen to what I say. <laughs> so that actually brings up uh, another topic that uh, a lot of people have asked about in terms of trying out different ideas and uh, in, especially in relation to where we are with technology today with the ability to do multiple playlists and stuff. And have you guys found that as technology has evolved, as we've gotten these newer features in Pro Tools and going from tape to Pro Tools to now like almost super Pro Tools in, in a way, that that has changed how you approach the art of making a record or the actual technical part of, of working on a record? Well, he wasn't really around in the tape days for very long, <laughs> so... Uh, okay, <laughs> I'm not drinking that. I mean, I mean, you'd, 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 you'd be able to track. answer more, more, more on that. I, I've been on Pro Tools since I was 14. Yeah. So you know, I've been using I, Pro Tools I, I understand, 17 but years. even, even yeah. in Pro Tools land, you know, we've seen in the past 15 years the abilities of Pro Tools yeah. literally have just shot up through the stratosphere. Yeah. And we've seen, you know, I have to teach it to people in our Pro Tools class, obviously. The ability to do things that used to take 10 minutes now can just go with yeah. one little one little freeze button can just instantly totally. do it. Totally. I mean, so I has that kind of changed the creative process of how you guys approach uh, making records with this newer I, functionality? I would say... For me personally, you'll have a different answer on this, but for me personally, it hasn't necessarily changed my process that much, um, other than I just can do my process faster. Mm -hmm. um, I think for, for guys like us, even before there were some of the shortcuts that there are now, we even we figured out shortcuts of our own to do a lot of the same things, and now, yeah, we have one button instead of three to, three to do the same thing in. 
Um, so, so for me, the process hasn't changed other than it's sped up, it's, it's, it's expedited, it moves faster. Um, but more than anything, it's changed for my clients because my clients are becoming keen now to it. They all have Pro Tools now. They, they didn't five years ago, even let alone 10 years ago. Um, whereas now they do, so they understand the process of editing a little more and tuning vocals and comping and, and things like that, which can be um, both a blessing and a curse. Some bands bring in awesome demos now because they can create much better demos and much better s starting points of songs. <laughs> I'm really lucky that most of my bands, you know, they we've been doing, doing so many records that they trust the process and that they rarely even care or get involved in that. You know, the singer's not here while I comp. In fact, really, I mean, I worked with my, well a lot of my singers so many times that I just know what they'll like, and I, I, I know what I like, I know what I need, I know what they like, and so very rarely does someone ever come back to me and say, can you change that word or that line? I don't like how I sang that line. It's that, you know, yeah. I just really try to understand them as we go so I don't have to waste my time doing something I know they're not going to like or something that won't work. I think more than anything, it's, it's, it's little things too. They know how quick it is to turn a computer system on <laughs> and punch some and punch something. So, so even if it doesn't need to be punched, so, sometimes they, they're like, let me just try this real quick because they, they start to know how quick it is. And because my philosophy is to try stuff and the way I work is a really fast paced way where it's so fast to try something, you know, so, sometimes you, 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 get, you get, st get stuck going down roads you don't need, don't need to go down when people are aware, I think, of that, of that process a little bit more. All of this stuff about approaching the initial part with the philosophy of dealing with people and communicating with them and whatnot, I'm assuming that this leads to some direction in the recording process, the actual production process. And uh, a lot of people have also asked when they wrote in, um, a lot of people seem to uh, subscribe to the Tom Dowd philosophy of drums and bass are the foundation of a song. This is the tracks that the train lives on. So um, a lot of people have asked about the drum sound that you guys have on, on all these albums. Uh, it's a really prominent, very big drum sound. Is there a specific type of process that you guys go through when you start thinking about recording drums, putting drums together for this type of sound? Is there something that's that you guys always like to do or certain types of microphones or preamps or things like that that you do to get that, that tone that, that people recognize. Yeah, I mean, we both have similar processes because we both kind of discovered things at the same time. I mean, what people don't realize is that the drum sound that we're mostly known for when you talk about when people ask about that sound, uh, we kind of made it up on his stuff, on his solo stuff. It's like, you have to understand as a drummer, I, even though I liked music like, you know, from the 80s, like Def Leppard and ACDC, and that so I had that low kind of thuddy snare, as a drummer, I was the crank it piccolo style and rim shot every two and four. And that's, as you know, most drummers would always prefer to play that kind of drum head than one that's detuned and like soggy and you can't do anything thing with it. But, uh, on his music, the stuff that he was doing at that time when he was a, a younger dude, uh, he, he, um, had a low, fat snare. He'd play me stuff I wanted to sound like this. And I go, well, how'd they do that? So it doesn't sound like it's hitting the rim. They don't hit the rim. I just use a stick, the head, the head on the drumstick on the head. It's fatter without the crack, and then we can compress a different way. If we maybe don't use the cymbals, I can bring the room sound up. So all our decision-making process really came from me basically producing him in a sense, or me working with him, and us interfacing back. So a lot of the sample the sample library we've accumulated over time kind of started with his music in our house. Mm -hmm. And even if as we went, it morphed and changed, you know, according to what band I was, I was doing, um, that was kind of the foundation of that sound, let's call it. Mm -hmm. um, so lots, while discovering that, you know, lots of the processes kind of became similar in the sense that, um, you know, every some sometimes if I got a guy like I got to produce a guy like Vinnie Paul, he has a definable drum sound that is different than the stuff that we've done. Um, but yet at the same time, he's he's mature and pro enough to realize the advantages to changing his drum sound a little bit. So I'll work with him, and it's usually for for me, it's usually for like a new band, it's like old school, set the band up, get the drum kit happening, let's make that drum kit sound as good as you want it to sound, and we'll work with it. Obviously, a guy like Vinnie wants more top end and more 10K, 
on his kick drum and those kind of things. I mean, he defined an epic drum sound himself. So for me to change that, I mean, I got we really have to work with each other. But he he's got these big oversized toms, so that dictates a certain thing. Um, and then we'll get that sound as good as it can. And then after that, then I'll usually get them to like give me a few hours to kind of then dick around it myself. Um, you know, generally I'm adding samples on stuff, but not always. Like say on toms, I hardly ever add any samples because I just get them to sound good. But the definable kick drum these days has a certain thing, mm -hmm. you know, a certain weight to it that you can't always just get by just that one drum and by a guy playing inconsistently. Not talking about Vinny, but just any drummer playing inconsistently on the drum. You want that thud every every time. So, you know, then we at least I would dig into my bag of you know enhancer samples, but always trying to enhance the drum kit, the existing drum kit, rather than can, trying to make the drum kit match the samples. Although we've done that too, where we love our samples, but we just wanted to make it a little bit more realer. So we'll program like on one of his songs, we'll program the drums. And then I'll go out there and play it on a real kit, what we've programmed, and then we'll blend in both. Mm -hmm. And in that case, I'm actually almost tuning my live snare to sound like the sample does, just so it doesn't sound like a four-note chord of snares, which is yeah. pre getting pretty common these days, as people realize they can put any samples on, and all of a sudden it doesn't sound like a snare drum anymore. It sounds like a, you know somebody playing a snare chord. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it's neither good nor bad. It's just you know, people's taste and other things. So when so getting back to the drum sound, so we some of the things I do that we've done that might give it a, a definable sound compared to other people is simple things and, and nothing is the same. No band one band is the same exact thing, you know. But I like to re the guys to record chord without cymbals because then I can really raise the room mics up. And if you you can't do that when somebody's crash riding, you know, riding on his crash that's a lot of high-end spray going into your room mics that all of a sudden you cease to almost hear the drums in the room mics anymore and all you hear is high-end spray. Especially if you want to have a bright snare drum and you are already increased the brightness on those room mics, all of a sudden now you got problems because the guy is way heavier on his crash cymbal than he is on his snare. So different things like that. So just to alleviate that, we just put foam cymbals up there and the guy can still play like he's normally playing and then we'll get, we can have almost any unlimited amount of, of definable, undefinable drum sounds that we can change at a later date because there's no cymbal bleed. Um, and then we can just add in cymbals later. The other reason why I do that too is because uh, for me, a lot of times when guys are writing with me or not bringing in complete songs, those songs will go through changes. So right to the end, we might change a part. And if I had to have the guy go back in there and replay that one little drum part again, that, you know, it's free set up the drums. You know, if in the early days when we booked another studio, we'd have to book that studio again. Uh, it becomes a lot more difficult to, to do if you've got cymbals in the mix because you can, you know, if all of a sudden there's a push on a kick drum and there's no cymbals, I can just move that kick drum over and nobody's going to know mm -hmm. uh, and then just change where the cymbal goes. Whereas if you have cymbals and a hi-hat and stuff like that, it's sometimes hard to edit the stuff afterwards to what you want. Mm -hmm. And the bands have learned to like that process, that they come in with one idea and by the time you're done, it's a whole different thing. So let's let the guy play and let's get a good vibe going on. But that's always sub subject to change at any time because somebody could have a good idea at any time. That It's like in the early days, you call it pre-pro where the band would go into a warehouse for three months and get all the stuff down and then just go record it. Well, now we can do that in the, process, in the studio now. Forget about those first three months. And then once it's right, you capture it right then and you move on. You know, I, I don't think I've done pre-production pre for 10 years now because it just wastes my time. Yeah, I don't do pre-pro either. <laughs> right? It's like if you've got good ideas that are pretty close, just come in, we'll capture it, and then if we need to change it, we'll change it right then, and then it's done. You don't have to remember it three months from now and write it down and do it the same way and probably forget the way you did it any, anyways or forget what I told you the first time. It's like, well, let's just get it done now. And that saves us time. Now, that actually brings up a, a really interesting thing that uh, I recall from when I first met you many years ago um, in terms of the production thing, you'd, you stated in an interview back then that during the recording process, you're basically mixing because of the capabilities of Pro Tools. Is that still, still the case that you guys find yourself as you're in the, the production process that you're making adjustments that are mix related and mix oriented towards the, what will be the future mix? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. As much, I think we both prefer, prefer to work that way. Um, the only times you kind of can't is if, if some sort of other variables like you have like the band wants to use a real drum kit only and you have to record drums at the end well it makes it kind of tough to mix 
to mix properly as you go when you don't have the actual drum tracks you're using on the record. Um, but I think when you're using, doing how we do it, recording things separate, recording, you know, using things like samples and the writing process and stuff like that, um, it allows us to definitely start m mixing, start dialing in that guitar and that vocal and that bass sound to where once we're kind of finished the song, the mix only almost needs some cleanup and some finesse rather than like having to invent it or whatever. Um, and I think we like that too because the client gets to hear, you know, the end result while you work. And it's not one of those things of you're wondering, what's this going to sound like when it's mixed? What's it going to sound like when it's done? It's now it's going to sound like what we're listening to right 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 now. What you what you're hearing is what is is that? And um, I I think that's it's more. You, you gain trust that way better, I think, I find with the clients. When they can actually hear what it is and not feel insecure and the anxiety of wondering, um, it makes it makes them more agreeable <laughs> to, to go on the ride. <laughs> yeah, it gives them definitely uh, confidence that, especially the first time they work with that, after we work with someone for the first time, sometimes they can get more difficult to work with because they're so spoiled at that point. <laughs> but the first time it's like, let's not guess about this. You know, Let's not go through 12 songs and then bring the faders down like in the old days and then start mixing. It's like, this is what it sounded like. So if you don't like this, tell me now and we'll change it now. You know, I think it's, I mean, I remember those days when I was in a band and you record all this stuff and you thought you had the best guitar sound of all time. And by the time the mixer's done, a new guy who wasn't even there to record it, it's like the sound is nothing like you thought it did. You know, I think it's important to establish that from the start. And not only that, I think you make better decisions based on, okay, well, this is what we really want it to sound like. This could be the best guitar sound in the world, but if it doesn't match and get fit into this whole mix that we all have agreed is good, then it's got to change. And so uh, I think my production's got a lot better once I realized you have to take sonic responsibility on the way, not just at the very end. I mean, a lot of times in the early days, I just make sure the drums were recorded cleanly, nothing had distortion on it. We could always MacGyver it later at, a, at another time. But now I like to kind of get it done because even when I'm doing guitar tones, I'm kind of sculpting them as I go and volume changing and, you know, so really when the artist goes home with that, let's call it the pre-mix mix, mm -hmm. that they can give me um, a confident response that they like it, they don't like it. You know, when the label needs to hear stuff, you know, which hopefully doesn't happen very often during that process, but when we have to send some works of progress in, it's like, it, they're going, this is already great, what more do you have to, have to do? I mean, those are much better positions to be in than somebody second guessing you along the way going, yeah, I'm not sure about this. This doesn't quite sound like what I thought it was gonna sound like. And then we have to explain, well, no, we're gonna do X, Y, Z and A, B, C still, but we haven't done it yet, so just give us a second. Then they're wondering. Whereas if you just give it to them on a platter, it's going to be like this, but 20% per percent better. <laughs> they understand. And then they, can, and then they can legitimately tell you, well, we don't want that. We want something else. Okay, well, that's, well what do you want? You know? So I, I think mixing as you go is really, really great. And, you know, I mean, like Kane says, there's still stuff that has to be cleaned up and changed at the end. And some plugins we like using are, have a lot of latency and it's hard to track with that stuff on. So it, it'll always get kind of changed later, but it's not a reworking, bring all the faders down and start from scratch. It's like, you know, let's just mute everything but the drums and make sure they're as good as we think we can get them. Let's add the bass and oh, we didn't roll it off as much. Let's make sure we can define, you know. It's kind of like those decisions get, you know, the fine decisions get made at the end. Maybe the automated EQ on the vocal I'll have will only get done at the end. But on the way there, you know, it sounds like all the bells and whistles, all the effects, all the little extra tricks, you know, the lo-fi stuff, if we do or not, it's all there for them to hear and then tell me they don't like it. So when it comes down to the mix, they can already go home and it's almost better like that because then they can listen to it on a system that they're comfortable with. Then it's not just not listening here where almost anything can sound good. It's like they're listening to it in their car. And so when they get, and they're, they're even playing their demos in their car before I even send them the mix. You know, uh, and so they'll even be, as soon as they get home, they can say, yeah, I think the snare drum's a little too blah, 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 here. Is there any way you can change that? And I go, yeah, I can change that. And then we kind of work on that. And by the time it's done with the mix, it's like one or two passes and I'm done. Mm -hmm. You know, and the label too. They, they already know what's coming too. So they're, they're just anxious for me to, 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 to deliver it almost more than actually adjudicate it mm -hmm. and tell me what they like or they don't like. You know, they're confident. Mm -hmm. So it seems like you're touching on what people have asked about in terms of, um, how much different is the mix than the recording? It seems like you guys are really committing to the sound and working with that sound, making those decisions moving forward. You're not really changing 
a whole lot in the mix uh, as some people would assume. Yeah, no, we're we're most of the time. I mean, there's never any rules and playbook and stuff. You know, you you have to adjust. But most of the time, if it's an if it's an album project, it's there's not a lot of surprises on that path. You know, they're not. You know, occasionally I'll in my own mind I'll know. Okay, I can make this sound way better. I don't want to take the, the artist's time now. They have to leave in two days. I'll do this later. You know, when they're not here. Like even a guitar tone, if I got the DI, I can flip through a bunch of amps later. If it's not a guitar player I'm working with, if it's just a singer or something like that, I don't mean just a singer because they're the most important one. But <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? I'm not going to sabotage a guy's sound after he leaves or anything like that. Right. But at the same time, if I think you know what, this could sound better, but we got to move forward. Like Kane says, the momentum is important too. So I don't want to be stopping for hours while I investigate new plugins and you know different ways of fixing a problem. So it, 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 we'll, we will dig in a lot later, but a lot of times, in fact, it's almost digging in for me more than the artist where I know I'm not happy with some things. There's too much woof on that low, quiet lead vocal in the verse, but I don't want to take all the, all the low mid out, so I just sculpt it out afterwards. And so they, when they get it, you know, if they're not tech savvy, they don't even know why it sounds better. It just sounds better. What did you do with this vocal? And maybe I just put a little bit of automated EQ and turn the effects up and down every now and then. Mm -hmm. So it's always more things for my quality control, or I'll play it for him and he'll give me his opinion. And I'll usually hate it, but I'll still listen to him and change it at least try <laughs> but that's why it's you have to work with people you trust again so you have to understand that someone else's opinion isn't always bad and uh that's how we all grow and i think as as we say for myself as i have a tendency to let's say get higher in that production ladder um you almost need to listen more because it's easier for people just to accept what i do now in the early days it's always like i always had to prove it was good you always had to do a b mix and all have to do this and this whereas now it's mostly and he gets a lot of, a lot more of that than me but usually when people when i send something the fan product there's usually not a whole lot of dis discussion or or comments because we've already had those comments at the start and they've already been getting updated mixes as we as we went um so but now it's you know especially if i'm working with the band like with five finger i'm on album number six we know each other really well at this point in time. I know when I do something, which one of the members isn't going to like it or which one is going to like it or how I can work this into it. Or if I think that it just has to, I just have to campaign for it and say, look, guys, I think we really need to do do this. But uh, but when it comes to mixing, you know, they're all really, really comfortable with how we do it and they know the process and they're listening to mixes in their cars and home studios as we make it and giving me their comments. So it's, you know, it's easier for me because then if I have one morning when they're late, I can just start noodling with some of their notes. Um, and then so by the time the end of it, it's not that long and everybody's happy and nobody's panicked because you're putting in 18 hour days trying to get this thing done on deadline. And You know, um, you know one of the things that you, uh, you touch on in relation to this, of like hard, handing the artist the demo, um, we've discussed in the past the concept of mixing of chasing the demo where you're mixing for somebody and they've listened to the demo as it were which not a lot of demos nowadays but they've listened to so long that any new version of a mix is unpleasing um, so it seems like you guys counteract that chasing the demo concept by just actually making quote the demo the mix as you work along and everybody's comfortable and happy absolutely. making decisions along the way absolutely I mean that's, that's essentially why we don't do pre-pro so we're we're tracking and that first take if it's the magical take that's the take on the record it's not we're not two weeks later trying to re-sing that take on a better microphone in a different room you know hoping that it has the same magic that it that it did in the m moment that they might have thought thought it up i mean lo lots of time way we work we're not even we're, we're doing we're doing bits and pieces we're, we're we're writing as we go so we might be writing a verse and that we might write that verse with the artist two minutes before we sing it line by line he might um, we might change a line and the singer just gonna go run in there and punch that line real quick he's not gonna come in two days later to do it or the next night to, or or anything so you kind of get that instantaneous you know ho hopefully instantaneous excitement and energy and you know we, we've all written songs so we all know that awesome feeling of when we think we came up with something cool and how we feel inside and i want my artists performing at the at the, at the mic with that feeling you know not just trying to simulate it now I, I was going to say I, th I, th I think that that's 
that's really a key advantage to doing it the way that we do it too because there is a certain magic about creating it at the time in your headspace and if you got to get into that headspace again three days three months later that headspace is gone mm -hmm. and even you know it's interesting between me and him i mean i like to think that i'm a pretty good vocal producer but lots of times when he's just doing his demos before we start working on a track with with him uh he does songs, things vocally that I could never seem to get him to do, and he just will naturally do it or do different things, right? I try not to get in the way of that. And if I can't make it better, then we don't even worry about it. Or if, if I'm trying to make it better and we don't, we go back to the original vocal. But I think, I, think, I think it isn't just me wrecking it as much as just the extra, uh, the extra in, um, feeling that you're getting when you're creating it it's like yeah you know that's spon yeah. spontaneous kind when, of when i'm tracking my vocals i'm yeah. literally writing my vocal and, and singing a line and writing and singing a, singing a line so yeah. definitely it probably has some of that even if it's not thinking about the performance whatever, yeah. i guess that yeah and the other thing i just wanted to say too quick was that there's no sonic rules mm -hmm. in a sense that people think well you know it's ideas that sell it's like we can talk about how expensive the studio is and all the expensive equipment and microphones I have, but honestly, you know, if you got a fifty-seven hundred dollar mic and you got some kind of half ass preamp, you can do a lot of recording with that that will sell you just as many records as paying well, I shouldn't say that, as paying, you know, the money to come in here and do that. But it's about getting the good idea. And so even when I for us, for our clients, I don't sell people the studio time when they work with me. I just sell me. And it doesn't matter where we work, you know. You know, my advantage is bringing me, not necessarily how expensive the gear is. And if you're more comfortable working in that cabin at the top of the mountain with an LE rig, it doesn't matter to me in a sense because it's about what you sing into that microphone that matters to people. Nobody, I don't think I, I've ever gotten seen an, um, some kind of a fan comment on a page or on iTunes or wherever it is saying, <clears throat> this sounds really great. I just wish they would use a 251 instead of a 47. <laughs> Nobody cares. <laughs> Even drum-wise, they don't care. They just don't care. It's just, does it inspire them? Does it not inspire them? Do they want to sing it? Do they not want to sing it? The quality is, is almost, as people have proved, in the sense that there's probably less quality <laughs> sounding recordings out there now than there's been in the past, but I, I have to you know, get my head on straight that the end goal is the music, not me thinking that it sounds better than anything else. It's like, is this... Is this going to affect people's lives? And that's what makes a fan, and that's what gives an artist a career. Yeah, I think we've uh, finally a lot of us have realized that it's it's about the fans, and the fans don't judge based on the equipment that we use. That nobody ever comes and takes away a platinum plaque because you didn't use a forty-seven. Yeah. No offense, the forty-sevens, yeah. but uh, it's it's not as much about the equipment. It's about the connection with the fans, and and even the the concept of a. Uh, bad recording, good recording, bad mix, good mix, is very subjective to the fans. People love s certain things that, that you or I might look at and be, oh, I, wouldn't record if it, I wouldn't have recorded it that way, but fans love it. And exactly right. That's all, all that matters. You know, before we, uh, we depart for the day, do you guys have uh, any advice for people out there? Because a lot of people have asked, like, how you guys got started and how you would relate some advice to people that want to continue and possibly pursue a career path such as yours, whether it's engineering, songwriting, production, the entirety of it all that it is nowadays and, and moving into the future. What would, you, what would you tell somebody who wants to get to a position that, that you guys are in and, and pursuing? Don't. <laughs> There's easier jobs in life. There's easier things to do with your time. You, you have to be prepared to um, have the worst of days and the best of days, too, if you're lucky. I've, I've, I've had a lot of good days, you know, so I can't, I can't bitch. But at the same time, it's very competitive and very brutal. And, um, but I feel lucky every day coming in here and, and working, so I guess it's worth it. Um, as far as what do you do, uh, just get good. It's really, and good doesn't mean being able to get the best snare sound in the world. Good means overall good. It's like people hire me, because, you know, some of the reasons why people hire me is that, or that not why they hire me, but why they like working with me is because I can maintain order in a room of chaos. <laughs> <laughs> um, and do it so that everybody walks out happy. You know, so nobody, I don't really favor one band member over another, whether it's the singer or the drummer. I mean, you have to keep, I like bands to stay as bands and be in a collective. And 
And so I, I don't, you know, band is like a marriage, but instead of married to one person, you're married to four other people. And so you have to work on communicating. And like most marriages, bands don't work on that, you know, in that sense. So I can help facilitate people getting along. So by getting good, I mean it's being able to talk to the A&R guy. It's taking care of business. It's it is making sure you got the technology side of it down. It is listening to a lot of music. It is trial and error. It is all those things. But the ultimate recipe for success is being good. And you get there by probably less by talent and more by hard work, by just working and working and working and trying and trying and trying and listening and listening and listening and doing different things like that. It would, it's of an advantage to start working for somebody better than yourself. Uh, whether that means another producer or just assisting a good engineer so you can learn those things, go help out a writer so you can learn how to write better songs, or even if you just watch the process, you will always learn. So I think surrounding yourself with really with people, really talented people, is extremely important. Um, and then you know, if you if you put it all into it, you know, you will you will get some kind of success from it. Maybe not in the way that you think. And even for myself, I mean, 20 years ago, I probably wouldn't have thought of myself as going to be, you know, doing all the hard rock records that I do. I mean, I love it, but at the same time, music was going in a different way. I just fell into this and seemed like my talents were good for it. So you don't always know where you're going to end up, but you will end up somewhere if you you're work hard and your heart's in the right place. I mean, I know that sounds kind of... Uh, it was, who's, who's it? The uh, self-help guy, Tony? Tony Robbins. <laughs> I know that sounds kind of Tony, Tony, to, Tony Robbins-ish, but just put put your heart in the right place and work hard, and and good things will happen. Yeah, it's definitely a little bit of the cli the cliche of of uh, hard work and per persistence. Definitely, you know, you gotta. This this is a business where you the mu not even just being a producer, but I'd say the music business in general is a business where you are confronted with failure more days than you're confronted with success. Um, so being able to wrap your head around that, being able to handle that, being able to see the big picture of, of the game that you're playing, I mean... Um, Failure is the only way that you really learn. Absolutely, and it's one of those things that, I mean, just like a sport, I mean, the best baseball players in the world only hit the ball 30% of the time. And that's, you know, that's still kind of like, like this, this business, you can't be right all the time, all you can do is Take as many practice shots as you can, and try, hope hope when you got to make the shot that matters, you you, you, you get it in. Cause keep you on swinging because because you practiced enough and and you and you persisted enough to keep getting that shot to take that shot. Yeah, it seems like you guys are. You keep on referring back to the the hard work is constantly learning stuff to make what you're trying to do better each and every day. So whether you're you're a songwriter, whether you're a producer, engineer, musician, all of these things entail learning. And the the more that you do it, the more work that you put into learning that thing, the 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 better the end result becomes by, yeah. by learning and practicing. Absolutely, try to understand and learn as many things as you can. I think both of us have thrived, be not because we're producers, be we've thrived because we're producers, engineers, mixers, writers, musicians, play you know, players, um, and it's all those talents that have allowed us to be good at any one of those things. Um, but had either of us just set out to just be a mixer or just be an engineer or just be a producer, I think our results wouldn't be the same, we and I don't think we'd have this place. I don't think I'm good enough to do any one of those things on their own. <laughs> uh, be, 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 be the same, that sounds terrifying. <laughs> it's, the, it's being um, able to attack everything. There's only a few people who can be a guy like Prince, or you know, be so naturally talented that you can just do it. I mean, for, for the rest of us, you know, regular people, we just have to try really hard. You know? And the persistence, I think, what he said is extremely important, because you have to understand, and here's a good example, that our assistant here now, uh, who's an employee of the studio, came to us for two years. He was trying to get a job with us for two years. And I basically didn't even really remember he was asking us for a job. But he kept coming back, and he um, eventually, did, for his school project, he had to do like some kind of a filming thing. So he, got, he arranged for Kane to answer some questions for like the documentary or film school project, whatever he was doing. And that let us meet him. I said, oh, this guy's actually okay. You know, again, it's that personality thing. It's that we, we blended in with him nicely. Um, and then when we moved from our old studio to this studio, we needed some labor. And that's when we find out how much the guy really wants that job. And I, I got my daughter, Chloe, to call him and ask me once, come help us move some stuff. 
And of course, he, I think he was going to, I don't know, Knotfest or some kind of Ozfest or some kind of big festival that date. He canceled that whole weekend so he'd come and help move drums from Studio A to Studio B. So because of that, you know, two years later, he got his job. And even then, we just took him on as an intern, but very quickly, he proved his value and he, and he got work. So just get good. You know, he got good, but he needed the persistence, it, you know, an effort to actually get to where he wants to be. And now he's recording stuff and doing his own projects. And that seems to be the, the common thread uh, that everybody in the, in the industry is, uh, has always said, that you just keep working. You yeah. never stop creating, whether it's, it's yeah. mixing, writing songs. You yeah. just keep working, you just keep working, you just keep working. And, and that in and of itself is practice. Yeah. And don't accept no. Labels turn, us, turn me down all the time. In fact, even to this day, people keep saying no. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean no. That means keep trying. Mm -hmm. That means try harder, find another angle, do it yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, generally for us, what no has meant was we'll just do it ourselves then. Mm -hmm. And even out of this day, I have some new artists that I'm trying to get signed. If they can't get signed, we're going to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to have that belief and, and, a, and a whole lot of work. Well, thank you guys so much. Cool. Until the uh, next time, we'll do some more videos with Promedia over here at the hideout. Thank you. Yeah.